Well, the weather's been blowing hot and cold around the world over the last couple of months with temperature records broken on both sides of the equator. And of course, in the UK, you will know it's been a rather cool and wet summer so far. And in July, temperatures in the UK as much as one degree below average. But there have been some particularly chilly nights, some of the coldest nights since 1918. In fact, in Highland, Scotland, on the 13th, the temperature dropped as low as minus 0.8 Celsius. But if you think you've been hard done by, spare a thought for the residents of the Atacama Desert in South America. Now, this is normally one of the driest places on Earth, with some parts receiving just, on average, about a millimetre of rainfall each year. And that's because the weather fronts are blocked from reaching the Atacama on both sides by the Andes and the Chilean coastal range. But in July, an extreme Antarctic cold front broke through and dumped as much as 80 centimetres of snow. Now, in contrast, in Australia, Sydney has had one of its warmest winters on record. There were 10 consecutive days above 20 Celsius. And on the 3rd of August, the temperature reached 26 Celsius. That is 8 degrees above the average and the warmest in early August for 150 years. And of course, that time in Sydney, it's the height of winter. And the reason, high pressure sitting over New South Wales, blocking the wet weather, the colder weather coming in across the Australian Bight and dragging in warm to hot air from the interior. Over in North America, heat has also been the story. In Texas, the temperature reached 117 Fahrenheit at Childress. That's 47 Celsius. And at Waco, the record of 42, 42 consecutive days above 100 Fahrenheit was smashed. Ultimately, it was 44 straight days of 100 degrees plus, and the area is still experiencing a severe drought. All in all, over 200 temperature records were broken. But what caused this extreme heat wave? Well, first of all, some very warm air was dragged up from the tropics over the Gulf of Mexico, reaching as far north as Canada. Normally, cooler air would flow south again. But on this occasion, a big area of high pressure formed high up in the atmosphere, blocking the normal flow of weather patterns. And for those underneath this area of high pressure, the sun just made it hotter and hotter. Here's John Hammond to talk about the Arctic ice and how it seems to be, well, melting. There are few places as barren or as dangerous as the North and South Poles. The Arctic to the North and the Antarctic to the South are forbidding places that put you on your best behaviour when you visit. Both are important to our weather too, so much so that scientists monitor them to see how the climate is behaving. The Arctic is an ice flow thousands of kilometres across and many, many metres deep, floating on the water around it. When the sun shines on the ice, the light is reflected upwards back into space. It has a high albedo. Now, if the surrounding temperature of the water increases, it melts the ice. And because water is dark and has low albedo, it absorbs the heat from the sun raising the temperature even further, melting more and more ice. A kind of runaway feedback process. So what on earth do I mean by that? Well, let me try and explain. This is the average of each year's minimum extent from 1979 to 2007. And even at a minimum, you can see the extent of the ice. There's an awful lot of it surviving through the summer months. Now then, jump forward to uh, one particular year in that period, 2005, and okay, it's contracted a little bit, but I think you'll find that year to year, it contracts, it expands, no big deal. However, let's jump forward again to 2007. Wow, we've lost an awful lot of ice. In fact, this was a record breaker, 2007. It was the record minimum sea ice extent in that year in the entire record that we have. So is this a, a runaway train, a process which is gonna gather momentum year by year and eventually we're gonna lose all the ice? No, it's not a runaway feedback process because in 2009, in actual fact, the ice extent expanded a little bit. But this year, 2011, we look like threatening the all-time record of 2007. So something, I put it to you, is going on. And to know what's going on and the implications of what's going on, you need to know this. You see, when sea ice freezes, it leaves salt behind and this produces a ring of very salty, dense water around the fringes of the Arctic sea ice. 
So when ocean circulations such as the Gulf Stream arrive at the Arctic, the very dense water around the ice forces that warmer water down back on itself. And it's this motion, a bit like the end of a conveyor belt if you like, that distributes heat around the world. So what do we know? Well, we know there's an awful lot of ice out there in the Arctic. We also know that the extent of that ice fluctuates from year to year, but importantly, with time, the gradual trend is for temperatures to rise and for the extent of the ice to shrink. Why is that important? Because the extent of the Arctic sea ice influences the ocean circulations around the globe, but importantly, it affects our very own Gulf Stream, which has a big impact on our British climate. So, you mess with the Arctic sea ice, you mess with the Gulf Stream, you mess with our climate.